Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 24 playthrough of the Buffalo Wings. The offseason will finally, mercifully for some of you, get underway today. Uh, appreciate all the thoughts over the last few days about what we should do and what we should not do this offseason. Uh, the input is always helpful to me, uh, whether I end up following your suggestions or not. So I appreciate all the ideas on what we should potentially be doing in arbitration, in the trade market, and with potential extensions for our players. And it is now time for the rubber to meet the road. And the first thing that I will share here is that uh, we do have an offer to get out from Bobby Bolig's contract. And I think that is step number one of what I want to do this offseason. And we're able to get out of Bolig's contract without retaining any money. And we had actually pushed it to a point where we were asking for some cash in return. Uh, we're basically getting nothing in return except that cash. We're getting a right fielder who is a non-prospect at 21 years old. We're getting Bolig's contract off the books. Uh, he is a good left-handed hitter, like the speed. He's competent defensively. Um, he's been an above-average offensive player every year that we've had him. But we've got a couple of younger, cheaper left-handed bats that can also play first base or corner outfield or DH at a similar level and keep as many options as possible open this offseason. I'd like to move on from Bowling. The issue with this trade offer, though, is that um, we've got to add another very useful major league player or prospect into the deal to get it done. And in addition to getting Bolig's contract off the books, we also have to include 21-year-old pitcher Mike Coleman, a former third-round draft pick who uh, had a decent year last year between rookie ball and A ball. Don't think he is a big-time pitcher, but certainly a potential fourth or fifth starter going forward. And then we would also need to include our backup catcher, Walt Miller, who could become our starting catcher next year if we move on from Andres Medina. Um, as Miller is set to make close to $5 million in arbitration this year. So if we did decide to sign Medina, we would likely be looking for a more cost-effective alternative uh, to be backup catcher for us next year. So right now there's a ton that we would need to give up to get Bolig off the books, and this deal really only works if um, we're committed to potentially making an offer to Medina to bring him back. Um, I don't have any more ability to shop players Today, I've used my five shop player options here over the last several days in real life um, on occasion in the episodes, more often than not, just offline. So we're going to have to move forward at least one day to be able to shop some additional players. But before we do that, um, we're going to jump back in on the arbitration decisions. And Isidro Ochoa looking for a long-term contract um, don't really think I want to do that he's a fifth starter for us and I don't know that he's gonna be anything more than a fifth starter for us down the line he's been a pretty average major league pitcher so we are willing to roll the dice, bring him back uh, for next year at $2.7 million when he has a pretty clear role as our number five starter once again. But with some of the young talent in the organization, he may not have that fifth starter role for many more seasons. So I don't want to make a commitment to him for many years at bigger money. 
So he will consider that offer, and we will potentially try to bring him back as well. Right now, I'm not inclined to make an offer to the wrecked 32-year-old Pat Mems, who's looking for around $8 million. may look to try to trade him. Miller, we've got to figure out what we're going to do at catcher. Edwards, we've got to figure out whether we want him back or not, coming off of a poor year. And then Hardage, the money isn't good. It's just a matter of do we really have a spot for him as a fifth outfielder next year with the fact that the young center fielder Elmquist likely needs to be on the major league roster. And uh, Hardage's peer, Tim Gaglia, is also going to be on the roster. So still a couple of decisions to make on the arbitration-eligible players, um, but we should be able to sort that out in the next couple of days of game time. So it's time, in my opinion, to see exactly what Andres Medina is looking for. And I get the feedback from some of you that the money he's looking for is crazy high, particularly for a guy who's now 30, who has really only been a starter one year in his career this past year with us. Although, to be fair, fair um, although he'd been a backup a few years with us, um, he generally played a pretty prominent role in the playoffs when... Um, Games were on the line. We played him more often than not um, during the postseason. But has had an above average WRC plus each of the last two years. Was a five war player this year. His contact and his home run power a little bit above average. Uh, draws an average amount of walks. He's going to strike out a ton. He's not going to hit a ton of extra base hits. But he's very good defensively. Very good in the clubhouse. And uh, he's also durable. Um, so I'm not expecting everyone to like this move. I don't know. I certainly don't love this move. I certainly don't want to be paying him $20.2 million a year with a contract with a bunch of optionality on his end. But I am willing to um, at least engage with him. Um, and since we don't have any money available for extensions... We're going to uh, just hopefully temporarily cut some budgets significantly lower to at least give us uh, a little bit of money to play with in the future. But you can see with some of our salary obligations for the year after next, um, we don't have a lot of flexibility, which is why it's so important to get Bolig off the books, whether or not we end up signing Medina. But I at least want to see... Uh, what he's looking for and whether it might be palatable to see if there's some middle ground that we can bring him back at because he has been an excellent defensive catcher and if he's a average or slightly above average offensive player I think he's an asset to our team even if we're going to be paying fair value for him I think it's just a matter of how high is fair value how many years do we actually have to go and what type of optionality is there in this deal for us as opposed to Funky Cold Medina? So we're uh, going to come in further apart than I normally start negotiations, but I uh, want to let Funky Cold know that the numbers he's looking for seem a little nutty to us. So he was looking for $20.2 million over five, a year over five years, as we talked about. We're offering him $15 million a year over five years, and the final two years of the contract are going to be team options. We've taken out the no-trade clause. We have kept in the incentives that he wanted in the deal. Um, I don't think that this is going to come close to getting it done. But this is a deal that I'd be more than willing to sign him to uh, with the optionality that we get for some of those final years. I'd probably even go, I would definitely even go for a bit more money than this. Um, question is with the two team options rather than the player options and the lack of the no trade clause, whether uh, this deal is going to uh, anger him in any way. I actually think I might 
up the average amount a little bit just to um, try to make things a little less dramatic for him in terms of the changes that we're talking about. Um, I guess we've only done it a little bit, but now we're offering him an average of 15 and a half million a year. The money's backloaded into those years where we have team options depending on what he's doing. I'm going to at least throw this one out here to Medina and see what he thinks. And we have to increase those options a little bit. Or the buyouts a little bit. He's willing to come down to four years. He's still looking for the same money, but he wants the no-trade clause and the player opt-outs. So we're going to have to, and he's basically only come down a little bit in the money. So I'm going to have to move um, significantly on some things to get this deal done. And we're now coming back to him. We're coming back with five years at $17.5 million a year. So we've moved our number up $2 million. We still want a team option for the fourth season, but then we're giving him a player option for the fifth season at a lower number. We've included the no-trade clause that he wanted, so we've got the ability to still get out after three years if we want. So the no-trade clause doesn't bother me as much in that context. Uh, I don't think the money's going to be quite there for him, and I think he still may object to that team option um, after the third year, but this is going to be our counter. He still wants all the optionality possible. Um, he's come down a little bit in money, um, but I think at this point, if we want to include the optionality that we want, we're going to have to come closer in terms of the dollars to what he's looking for, unfortunately. All right, he's come down to five years at 19.8 average. We're coming back to him with five years at a 19 million average. So the money is kind of there. The issue is he wants a player opt-out after the third season. Uh, we are still insistent on a team option uh, after that third season. Um, that's really the only sticking point at this point. And he's uh, pretty insistent. He hasn't changed his money, and he still wants the player opt-out. So I think I may just sit on this and think about it. Um, I'd like to have him back. I guess we could structure the deal in a way that it's really only a three-year contract, and we just kind of delay the... Um, inevitable so to speak by making it very attractive for him to opt out um, that's going to mean front loading more money for him the next three years which um, is not optimal but he seems pretty insistent that he wants that player opt out I guess the other option would be to maybe give him a little more money than he's even asking for um while keeping that team option for the third season. I might try that, because I would prefer to always have the option in my hand, and I would also prefer not to be totally front-loading this contract um, with a phony fourth year in there that will definitely opt out of, because then that just means that we're going to be paying him $23, $24 million a year for the next three years, which is... Uh, not what I want to do. So he was looking for 19.8 million a year over five years. We're actually coming back to him at 20 million a year over five years. Uh, the sticking point is just what happens after the third season. He wants it to be a player option. We want it to be a team option. And he's pretty insistent that he gets that player opt-out, and now he's looking for more money. So 
we're basically going to have to give him what he wants as far as the structure of this contract to get something done. All right, before we move it on, we're going to come back to him one final time. He was looking for four years at $22.1 million, um, so his number is starting to go up on us, but we're only coming back with four years at $19 million average. We're going to front load it a bit this coming season, um, presumably if we take Bolig off the books and we move on from Walt Miller, we can afford it to be a little bit front loaded. Uh, we're giving him the player opt-out after year three, along with the player option on year four, which he asked for, which uh, are quite honestly redundant. Um, but it's the last structure that he asked for. We're just giving him less money than he um, is asking for. And he's willing to think about that. So... We don't have a ton of optionality in this, but we're also only making a four-year commitment to him at most. Uh, could end up being a three-year commitment. So we are going to submit that offer to Funky Cold Medina, four years, $76 million. Um, He's got the optionality. I mean, my thought is he's 30 years old. I would not think that his defense is going to materially change over the next few years so he should remain one of the top defensive catchers in baseball over the course of the contract i would expect that his leadership will remain positive with his good personality traits uh, he's durable right now if he has some injury issues maybe he ends up normal but still should be a guy who we could count on for 120 plus games most years question is how long his bat holds up um, given that He's really just a contact home run power and eye guy. Um, he's not relying on gap power, so the lack, lack of speed doesn't matter that much. He's always been a strikeout machine. Um, I don't love the deal, but I think it's more important to have him back than Bolig. So we'll move forward a day now um, to give ourselves an opportunity to perhaps revisit shopping Bolig and shopping some other players and seeing uh, if we can free up the money that we're going to really need to pay for this contract because uh, presumably I'm actually going to want to invest a bit in scouting and player development going forward. And I think I have pulled together the blockbuster deal that I don't know if we need, but I think we're going to do. And the big part of the deal, the most important part, is that we're getting rid of Bobby Bolig, who admittedly is still a good player. But as I said, I've got other left-handed hitters who can play first base, DH, slash corner outfield with similar bats to Bolig that make a lot less money. So moving on from Bolig and not having to retain any of his contract for the next four years basically frees up the money for that Andres Medina extension. And we have to include Walt Miller, who is currently our backup catcher and has been our starter at some times, but we don't want to be spending almost $5 million a year for Miller to back up Medina next year, so... The fact that he has value is actually a positive for us because that gets some more money off the books and we'll end up going with a more economical backup catcher, assuming that we are able to sign Medina. The negative of this um, and the guy that we had to include to get the amount to be retained down to zero is that we have to include the first baseman, David Mendoza, uh, scouting discovery, who at the number 44 prospect in baseball is the second best prospect in our organization. But when I think about David Mendoza, he is a right-handed hitting corner infielder slash DH. Can't really even play the outfield. It's pretty mediocre defensively, doesn't have a ton of speed, 
Essentially, he's just a power and walk guy. He strikes out a ton, and his ability to make contact is a question. He's 20 years old. I do like the fact that he's durable. But two seasons in minors, he's hit 130 and 165, and he has struck out 212 times in... 343 at bats. Um, he has hit 18 homers. The power is there. But even though he's one of the top prospects in our system, I don't think his skill set is irreplaceable outside of a right handed middle reliever. I'd say probably the second easiest thing to find in this game is a right-handed first baseman slash DH with some power who doesn't have a lot of speed and doesn't bring much to the table defensively. So it certainly hurts to give him up to basically just get a contract off the books. But by including him, we're actually getting some things that are, in my mind, useful in return. We're getting some cash, which helps us just a little bit this upcoming season. Not something that's going to change our budget for the long term, but given that we're expecting to compete again this year, it will give us the ability to potentially take on a contract as we get closer to the trade deadline next season. And we're getting second baseman Jim Arp, or as I will refer to him, our Joe Edwards insurance policy, because Arp is basically a younger more proficient defensive version of Joe Edwards who's cheaper. Now he's not as good offensively. Edwards is off the chart with his eye, similar home run power, but they both struggle to make contact. Art probably is going to strike out even more than Edwards. He's only had two small stints in the majors with the Rockies each of the last two seasons. 252 hitter and 143 at bats, eight homers, has been a slightly above average offensive player. But I've talked a lot in the comments in previous episodes about Edwards at around eight million this year. If he performs like he did last year, he is a rough contract to have. If he has performs as he has in previous seasons, then eight million is fine for him. But Edwards' option year after this upcoming season, even if we do keep him around, is expected to be about $12 million. So even if we do end up keeping Edwards around this year, it's conceivable that we'd move on from him next year. And with ARP, we have a similar offensive profile, albeit not as good, not as much speed, but he is better defensively. But ARP would allow us to move Deshaun Seifu to third instead of Edwards and then upgrade defensively at second base by having ARP there. And ARP still has one option year left this upcoming season, so although I don't think he should be in AAA, if there was a numbers game because we kept Edwards and decided we wanted to have a Tegan Tiley or somebody like that on the major league team instead, we could stash Arp in the minor leagues for a season. So I think there's some value there. And then we also get the center field prospect Luis Nava, who is not as highly regarded as David Mendoza. But in some ways, I like him more. Uh, he's a similar age. He's a guy who's been more effective in rookie ball. And I don't hate his profile. He's a pretty good defensive outfielder. Could certainly play center field, and he could certainly be a gold glove caliber left fielder, most likely. He's got above average speed, although he's not a particularly proficient stealer or base runner. He's a really good bunter, and looks like he could be a pretty good contact hitter. Um, and he's going to have a little pop in his bat. 
and he's going to have a decent eye if he fully develops. Um, Left-handed hitter, so favorable if he ends up in a platoon situation where he'd be playing more. He's not as highly regarded as Mendoza, but when I think about this contract, I want to get rid of Bolig. I don't need Miller, and I want to get rid of the money. And to me, Mendoza, as we've talked about, although he is a four-and-a-half star prospect who could end up being a really good power hitter, not a particularly unique profile. For a decent defensive second baseman who looks like he can at least be a average major league bat and a guy who looks like he could be a pretty good defensive center fielder again who could actually have possibly a plus bat if he fully develops I kind of like this deal and I'm going to do it um, the most important thing is getting Bolig off the books but by including Miller and Mendoza who both off who both certainly have some value um we don't have to retain anything of Bolig's contract, and we get two pieces that could be useful in return, plus some cash. So I'm going to go ahead and complete that trade, and that will officially um, make us committed to ensuring that we get Andres Medina signed. Uh, the fan's not happy that we let Bobby Bolig go. And fan interest actually dips below 100 for the first time in quite a while. Do hope that with the fact that we've got um, a number of arbitration eligible players that we've made offers to that uh, signing those guys, uh, some of whom are popular, will get fan interest higher. And that move there, you know, clears the salary situation up a bit so we can certainly actually start putting... Um, some money back into our scouting and player development. The goal is to certainly get them back to the levels that we're used to them being, but right now we'll uh, keep them a little bit of lower just to, to give ourselves a little bit of uh, financial flexibility here in the coming days through arbitration and the beginning of free agency. So Bolig is gone. Miller is gone. We've made an offer to Medina, so our die is not quite completely cast, but we've started to make some big decisions that really will potentially change the direction of this franchise for uh, several years to come. And arbitration-wise, we've decided to make an offer to Tyreek Hardage, and with the money we freed up, getting out from under the contract of Bolig and the cash that we even got back in return on that trade. Good thing that Colorado is a win-now team and they were willing to kind of take him on. I think we are going to try to bring back Joe Edwards for at least one more year with us. As I mentioned with ARP, I feel like we've got an insurance policy if we decide to trade him during the season and or more likely move on from him next year when he's set to make around $12 million. But you look at his last three years, and although he was only an average offensive player this year, he was well above average each of the two previous seasons. As I talked about comparing him to Arp, you know, similar contact, a little better at avoiding strikeouts, a little bit more speed, not as good defensively. Uh, better eye and slightly less home run power. Overall, I think that Edwards' offensive package is better, as indicated by his 117 WRC plus over the course of his career. But I kind of um, like having both Edwards and Arp, a couple of guys with pop who can play multiple positions, both pretty good at drawing walks. Um, so we're going to try to bring Edwards back next year, too. And then it's just a matter of um, likely moving on from Pat Mems and seeing what, if anything, we can get in trade for him. And we've got another deal put together, which will take some more salary off of our team next year. Closer Pat Mems, who has been effective, very effective when healthy. Um, 
coming off of bone chips in his elbow. He's wrecked physically now, and he's going to be turning 33 next year. And his arbitration number is going to be close to $8 million. Um, as much as I like him, I feel with all the money that we're freeing up, if we need to add a frontline closer and we can't find one in free agency this year, there will certainly be the ability for us to pick up someone closer to the trade deadline next year if we do need to upgrade closer. So would rather get him off the books. You may remember Alejandro Mercado, Rule 5 pick from several years ago. He has mostly been a minor leaguer for us in AAA the last few years after we uh, got his rights by keeping him up a full season. But particularly with the addition of ARP, we don't really need him as a utility infielder. Doesn't have the same kind of bat as ARP, although defensively he's similarly rated and similarly versatile. But Mercado is out of options this year, so we'd have to get him through waivers to get him down to the minors. I'd rather just get his major league contract off the books. And then we need to include uh, catcher Ian Belden. He's the type of guy that we like to have as catchers in our minor leagues. He's a seventh round pick from a few years ago. Good defensive ability, so he helps the pitchers um, that he works with hopefully pitch better with that strong defense, but certainly not a real prospect with that lack of a bat. Uh, he's, you know, been a 260, 270 hitter between rookie ball and A ball, but is not a real prospect, um, but not the worst guy to have in the minor league system. So a lot of it is just getting Mems off the books and trying to extract a little bit of value for him. And we're actually back with our friends, the Colorado Rockies. And we're going to pick up Inahiro Miyaki, who was a free agent signing by them uh, a year ago. And fortunately for us, we're going to get them to retain a chunk of his uh, contract next year at $2.7 million they're going to be able to retain most of it. So we're going to be on the hook for just $1.1 million. Uh, Miyake is a left-handed arm. Um, looks like a decent reliever. Uh, his numbers in Colorado were not great, but I have to take in mind that he was pitching in Colorado. Got some real good personality traits as a guy who came over in his mid to late 20s from Japan. Does have two option years left, so we could also get him down to Albuquerque. So basically just uh, another replacement-ish level left-handed arm out of our bullpen. But with uh, Veliz and Walborn as our top two left-handed arms, we then will have Miyaki and the youngster Espinoza as a couple other potential left-handed arms in our bullpen, in addition, in addition to Juan Estrada, who's the one lefty in our starting rotation. So it does put us in a situation where we could conceivably have five um, of our 13 pitchers that will likely go north with being left-handers. And in the case of Miyaki and Espinoza, we've got guys who have minor league options if we decide that uh, we need to put one of them down uh, to AAA Albany. So not a huge return from Mems. There wasn't um, a ton of demand for him at the money he's making, but feel like this frees up a little more money for us next year, gives us a guy who could be um, useful. So we'll go ahead and complete the trade. Um, fans not happy that Mems is gone, so that's going to have uh, cost us another point in fan interest, but starting to free up some pretty significant money for next year, which as we've talked about, uh, most of it will put back into scouting and player development if and when we're able to officially get Andres Medina signed. But we are um, likely to also have the ability to sign guys to one-year contracts and free agency and or uh, pick up guys who are making some decent money in trades next year if we decide we do need to supplement that closer spot. Right now at this point, I think the thought would be to give a Veliz or a Varejo 
or perhaps even a Jimenez, a chance to be the closer next year. Uh, if that doesn't work out, though, we've got money to make improvements once the season does get going. And a couple days into the offseason here with the trade away of Bolig, the trade away of Miller, the trade away of Mems, and the offer to Andres Medina, uh, we've now made offers to all of our arbitration eligible players as well as Medina himself. Um, I don't think we're going to offer Yinger as good as he's been with us. And even though he's not looking for a ton of money, I uh, feel like we've got tons of pitchers for the back end of the bullpen at this point. Uh, Eddie Mosley didn't really work out for us. Um, we declined his option. No need to bring him back. Carlson we're not going to bring back. Uh, Bloomquist is just looking for insane money for a closer. So uh, we've made offers to the minor league free agents that uh, we want to potentially bring back. And we've got offers out to all of our arbitration eligible players. So at this point, it's a matter of uh, hopefully getting those arbitration eligible players signed. Maybe hopefully getting Medina signed. Again, I get that some of you don't like that. Um, I don't love the money that we're giving him, but I think um, to keep this game competitive for the next few years and to support our pitching staff as much as possible, I think it makes sense to bring him back on that four-year deal that we offered him. And um, we'll see if the potential signings of Medina and the hopeful signings of all of our arbitration-eligible players will kick our fan interest back up to a hundred or more than that. And then uh, we'll also find out uh, starting about a week from now, any uh, hardware and awards that our Buffalo Wings players are going to win this off season. And we've started to get some of our uh, minor league free agents as well as our arbitration eligible players signed. Uh, the fans excited to have Walborn back, Varejo and Ochoa also signed, Steve Anderson signed, which the fans are pleased with. Uh, so that puts us in a situation where we're back to 100 fan interest, still waiting to hear from Edwards, Gaglia, Hardage, and Medina Hopefully uh, some of those eventual signings um, will be players that uh, the fans are happy with. Medina in particular is extremely popular, so uh, that will at the very least uh, hopefully placate the fans and help us sell a few more tickets when all is said and done. And Joe Edwards is signed, so he will likely be back next year. Fans happy about that. Hardage also signed. Gaglia signed. Uh, the fans excited about both of those. So uh, we're in a situation now where nobody going to be going to arbitration, just waiting to hear on Medina. And uh, fan interest with those last couple moves is certainly at least a bit above 100, and hopefully we'll uh, get a big uh, bump win in if or more accurately, if and when, perhaps, Andres Medina re-ups with us. And we have gotten Andres Medina signed to that four-year, $76 million extension. Uh, fans are ecstatic uh, that he will be back. Uh, as we talked about a while back when we made that offer, a little bit front-loaded, $22 million this coming year, followed by three years at 18. He's got the option to opt out of that final season, so not a long-term commitment. Um, it'll take him through his mid-30s, given that he's durable, uh, great personality, and very good defensively. I think that uh, at the very least he's going to remain a premier defensive catcher, even if his batting ratings retract a little bit. Uh, if his offense is the way it's been these last couple years, um, certainly not going to be a bargain, but also not a contract that should become an albatross for us either. And with Medina signed, uh, we didn't win any gold gloves. We didn't win the Mariano Rivera Award. Uh, but apparently we did win some silver sluggers, or at least one silver slugger. Um, 
Deshaun Seifu, perhaps not surprisingly, at second base uh, is the lone Silver Slugger winner for us. Uh, Seifu had another excellent season for us. This is now his fourth Silver Slugger award. Um, he's won a couple of gold gloves back in the day, been a four-time All-Star, although he was not an All-Star this year. But uh, led the National League in hits for a fifth straight year, stolen bases for a tenth straight year and triples for the sixth time in his career, while also hitting above 300 for a fifth consecutive season as he picked up that fourth career Silver Slugger Award. And fan interest still listed at 100, but we know from the signing of Medina that it's uh, actually better than that. So now it's just a matter of uh, finding out any other big awards that we may win and um, hopefully getting a last handful of players we've made offers to to uh, return as minor league free agents signed and in what was a bit surprising news to me although I admittedly did not look around at the rookies across the league but Alexis Mendoza who is the National League Rookie of the Month uh, three times this past season, and it was 15-7 and seven with a 335 ERA, 216 strikeouts, and a 6-war. Uh, not only didn't win the National League Rookie of the Year, he actually finished fourth in the National League Rookie of the Year voting. Uh, Rookie of the Year Curtis Thomas of the Cubs, hit 300 with 26 homers and 77 ribbies, uh, three war on the season for the first baseman. Um, that decision by the voters doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Uh, Eric Hall of the Nationals, another first baseman, hit 305, 27 homers, 72 ribbies, 3.1 war also finished ahead of Mendoza along with Robbie Blanchard of the Dodgers uh, center fielder who hit 300 with 17 homers and 68 ribbies three and a half war um, so a bit surprising to me that Mendoza was so far back um, Joe Gallagher did get a few votes also uh, with 37 homers and 109 ribbies he had uh, more homers and more ribbies than any of those guys who finished top three in the voting Clearly, his 237 batting average was not the uh, 300 average that uh, was where those other guys were all around, and his war was much lower since he doesn't bring much to the table defensively. So not a surprise to see Gallagher uh, lower in the voting, but really shocked that uh, a three-time rookie of the month with a six war and a, a brilliant pitching season ends up uh, fourth in the voting behind a uh, couple first basemen and outfielder for the National League Rookie of the Year. And Alan Bowles, after guiding us to a 102-win season and the most wins in uh, baseball, won his uh, second consecutive Manager of the Year award for the Buffalo Wings here in 2037. Uh, just waiting to find out about Cy Young and MVP. Uh, don't think we're going to win either of those for a while. I thought we'd have a good chance with Deshaun Seifu to win the National League MVP. But at this point, uh, I think it will be quite a shock if the National League MVP uh, does not end up being Yoichi Kubota of the Phillies who led the league in runs, home runs, ribbies, slugging percentage, OPS, and WRC+. Even though his 6.8 war was a little less than Seifu's 7.1 I don't know how many players in the history of Major League Baseball have led the league in runs, homers, and ribbies in the same season, uh, but I would tend to think that uh, the vast majority of players who have done that have also been named MVP.
And we'll take a look at the uh, big awards here. The AL Cy Young Award winner, uh, unanimous selection to Leem Holland, 24-year-old uh, for the Minnesota Twins, was the sixth pick overall in 2035. And uh, he has a pretty impressive-looking profile. Was 11-8 and eight this year. Uh, but he led the league in walks, strikeouts, earned run average, strikeouts per nine innings, fit minus, and pitcher war. Uh, certainly with that incredible four-pitch arsenal of a world-class slider and excellent fastball change and sinker. Uh, expect him to be a uh, guy who could win a few more Cy Young Awards in uh, the next few years. Uh, the Seattle guys, Espatia and Lenig, who I believe have both won multiple Cy Young Awards. Lenig uh, won three, and Espitia also won three. I think between those two, they won the award six years in a row between the two of them. Um, they finished second and third in the voting as they remain very productive pitchers. In the National League, it was Mark Billings of the Reds, unanimous Cy Young Award winner, 28-year-old lefty went 21-6, and six, led the league in wins, innings pitched, and quality start percentage. Uh, we did get a few votes there, kind of interesting. Uh, Alexis Mendoza was only fourth in the Rookie of the Year voting, but he finished fifth in the Cy Young Award voting. And uh, Sincere Shazier, our number two starter, 14-7 and seven with a 282 ERA. Best year of his career for the 27-year-old finished second in the voting. Uh, our ace, Alexis Barajas, who won the Cy Young Award a year ago, uh, actually did not get any votes this year. Turning to the MVPs in the American League, a very split vote. Uh, looks like six different players received first place votes. And there were five players who had between 232 and 289 points. So a split decision, uh, but it ends up going to Domingo Ibarra of the Nashville Stars, uh, the first baseman, 307 average, a league best 52 homers, and 138 runs driven in. And over in the National League, uh, not surprising that Yoichi Kubota, uh, unanimous MVP after leading the league in runs, homers, ribbies, slugging, OPS, WRC+. Plus. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that Seifu finished all the way back in fifth. Um, Phillies finished first and second. Um, Luis Ortega... 262 average, 36 homers, 98 ribbies. He does do it while being a very good defensive catcher, so that makes some sense. Kendall Pearsall of the Mets, center fielder, had a uh, really nice year for a bad team. Uh, similarly, Kyle Tucker, at the age of 40, had a really nice year for a pretty mediocre Dodgers team. But uh, Seifu, despite his great season, finishes fifth in the voting. And uh, other than that, the only other player on our team who got MVP votes this year was the recently re-signed catcher, Andres Medina, receiving the first MVP votes of his career at the age of 30 years old in his first full season as a starting catcher in the major leagues. And we have finally made it to the start of free agency where, as I talked about, uh, we've got the money to be players with guys who are looking for only one-year contracts um, or a lower-priced guy who's looking for multiple years. Although, to be honest, as we've talked about, I still would like to increase scouting and player development a bit from where they are right now. So... Probably not going to be huge players in free agency for this upcoming year. feel like we uh, had the best team in baseball, at least during the regular season last year. And uh, bringing Medina back, uh, we've filled 
what could have been a huge hole on our team. Not really improving there, just kind of maintaining the status quo. We have lost a little bit. We need a backup catcher. Uh, we've lost a little bit at closer, perhaps moving on from Mems. And we've lost a little bit in terms of our offense, in terms of moving on from Bolig. But feel that in all of those cases, um, we've got adequate options in the minor leagues or already on our major league roster. And with the exception of backup catcher, feel that we've, we've quite honestly got more than adequate options. Uh, as I talked about, to potentially be a closer between Valiz, Varejo, and Jimenez and potentially is a left-handed first baseman slash left fielder slash DH with Carranza uh, likely to take over for Bolig. Uh, Alex Feller's still in the mist. Elmquist potentially coming up and then Heiner still back. Feel like we're decent in both of those positions. Um, and backup catcher is an area where we've got a couple of options in the organization right now. I mentioned some of these in a comment to, or a response to a, a question slash comment from Patrick DeBonis. Ted Jackson, 27-year-old, who we picked way back in 2028, career minor leaguer for us, but a good personality. Uh, don't love the defense. The bat is not incredibly impressive. He's been a backup the last few years in Albany, hasn't gotten a lot of playing time. We've generally gone with better defensive catchers um, to kind of help our pitchers. Um, but he would be one option as a backup catcher. The other one who is further away would be Jorge Berrios, uh, international free agent signing from 2032. Defense with him is a little below above average. Um, the batting profile is um, kind of insane um, when we look at his career stats. Over the course of his career, uh, he's a 197 hitter in the minors, which is insanely bad. But despite hitting 197 in the minors, he's got a 405 career on base percentage in the minors uh, with an insane 312 walks. Um, only 974 official at bat so he's walking in almost a quarter of his plate appearances and uh, despite that 197 average the fact that he does have some home run power and he walks at a an absolutely insane rate um you know a Barry Bonds slash Ricky Henderson type of rate I'm guessing the rate might be even more extreme than uh either of those players had over the course of his career. He's actually still been an above average offensive player despite not having a 200 average for his career. So I don't think he's quite ready for the majors right now. Right now, I think my plan, if we don't find a catcher in the free agent market or the trade market or the Rule 5 draft or on waivers to become a backup to Medina, I think my initial plan would be to have Ted Jackson in the majors as the backup with Jorge Barrios likely playing every day in Albany. And if Medina did go down with an injury, which I'm hopefully not expecting, giving the money that we're paying him and his durability, but if Medina went down with an injury and we needed someone to play every day, I would probably promote Berrios and uh, let him get the action every day. I think that's kind of the tentative plan for catcher right now, but it is certainly an area where backup catcher uh, could be upgraded this offseason. Looking at international uh, free agents who have entered the market, take a quick look just to see if our scout thinks anyone has really high levels of potential. Um, the reliever, Juan is a choir, uh, decent prospect. Um, we will request a scouting report on him contract-wise. Uh, he's looking for a minor league with major league options. Uh, we could do that to him. The profile's not so exciting that I'm not willing to... Uh, get a scouting report on him and risk losing him. 
uh, another reliever, Hasufimi Hirata, out of Japan, uh, left-hander looking for $4.4 million. Uh, we're probably okay at lefties at this point with the trade that we made to pick up Miyake, but we'll scout him. 24-year-old reliever, Jesus Viatoro. Oof, don't love the lack of stuff with him. Um, you know, if we could put him in our minor league system, wouldn't um, be averse to bringing him on board, but probably not a guy that we're going to offer major league money to. And from a quick look, um, doesn't seem like there's any real top-end talent in the free agent class of international free agents. Take a quick look now at the overall free agents and uh, similar crew to what we anticipated it might be there were uh, i believe five three and a half star or higher players who uh, were going to be potential free agents as position players and uh, one of those five was andres medina who we had re-signed so Michael Harris the second, Daniel Maldonado, Dan Mathiewicz, and Kyle Tucker on the market. Uh, don't think we would be serious contenders or have serious interest in any of them. If uh, one of these other catchers ends up going for a little less money, could potentially bring them in as a backup, but uh, certainly not going to be spending crazy money for a backup catcher. So the uh, trade market may be a more fruitful area for us to investigate. Pitching-wise, uh, our former closer over the last several months, Chris Bloomquist, looking for a lot of money. Uh, Dan Bush, another closer, looking for some big bucks. Uh, so there's a few front-end pitchers available. Not really uh, anything too exciting at all among the starters. We thought Melvin Amador would be the only three-star guy out there, and it looks like he is, quite honestly, with Barajas, last year's Cy Younger winner, uh, topping the rotation. Shazier and Mendoza, who both received Cy Young votes this year as our two and three starters. Uh, the lefty two-way player, Juan Estrada, is our four and Isidro Ochoa back uh, after signing the arbitration offers our number five starter. Don't feel like we need to do anything to uh, change or improve the rotation, which was one of the best rotations in uh, baseball last year when all was said and done. So probably not going to be real big players in free agency, particularly at the high end of the market. As I noted, we do have money to potentially spend, but Probably we'll end up using the most of that money to um, supplement our scouting budget and player development when all is said and done, and maybe bring on some contracts through the trade market. Um, don't expect us to be real active in free agency this year, but with the uh, departure of Bolig and the signing of Medina, uh, I think we've kind of... Uh, made our big moves perhaps already for this off season, even though it's only December 1st. But we'll find out what, if anything, uh, we decide to do in free agency in our next episode. Until then, thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.